Yeah. That's how it's going to work. Just focus on the screen. Yeah. Go ahead. Okie doke. Are we good? Yes. Let's go. So, my name is Steph Walter, and I work at Red Hat. I'm here to show you Cockpit today. I'm excited about Cockpit because I love integrating things, pulling things together, making them work. Lots of people take stuff 90% of the way and then don't connect that last part that makes things work for everyone. And I love doing that part. And that's why I got involved in this project. I want to show you how Cockpit looks, what it does, but also how it works. So, this is, I'm not going to be bullshitting you here, I'm not going to be showing you videos, unless something that totally crashes and goes weird. You can do everything I'm going to show you on your own laptop. So, this is during the Hackfest, the, the end of the conference. Feel free to open your, open your uh, machines, go to this URL. We'll be posting this URL at the bottom of the screen later on as well. So, if you suddenly get interested, it won't, uh, it won't be hard to jump in. And there's going to be lots of demos, real demos, on this machine here. And obviously, one of them has to fail, right? You get to laugh, but the failure is the proof that it's actually real. And not like just magically doing stuff behind the scenes. This is really released stuff, already released in CentOS, RHEL, Fedora, everywhere. So, Linux has traditionally been kind of like building your own truck. We give you all these pieces. Here's some wheels, here's the motor, right? here's the fuel tank, and so on. You get to choose the best pieces, the perfect ones for your use case. Bring them together. You can build big trucks, powerful, impressive. You can clone those trucks out, like container images or virtual machine images. You can, actually this was containers. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Linux says containers. You can do things no one, no one really thinks should work, but somehow it works for you. Uh, you can overload those systems. Just intense and insane. You tweak the last bit of performance out of them and somehow they survive. You can make incredibly sleek, beautiful, powerful systems. And of course you can get it all wrong. <laughs> but what if you just want to drive it? What do you do? This is what it looks like to drive Linux. Now, to those of us familiar with Linux, this seems very natural, very normal. In fact, once you get a root prompt on a system, it feels like power. It's exciting. You can take over the world from a root bash prompt. But for those trying out Linux and getting to know it, and those who are not familiar with all the internals, and they don't have this mental model of how it all comes together, that looks like this. Freaky. So, in the Cockpit project, we set out with two goals. Um, one of those is to make Linux usable, Linux systems, Linux servers usable by non-expert admins. And secondly, even for those who have been steeped in Linux, to be able to make complex tasks easy and discoverable. Okay, I'll show you some examples of both of those things. So, we, uh, Cockpit, you can log in with your web browser. It's a remote interactive console. And I'll show you logging into Cockpit on port 9090. Why is it port 9090? Because port 9090, if you look it up with the IANA, is actually the web SM port, web system manager port. And here we have a real login prompt. This login prompt, I'm going to type the credentials for this system as I went into SSH. Admin, password, and in I go. You can see information about the system. You can do things, are obviously trivial tasks like changing a host name and off you go to the races. Now that's simple things, things you know how to do already. So for some, but for someone who's coming into Linux, coming in straight, these, this helps them discover the system. It immediately allows them to perform tasks. So, a remote interactive Linux admin interface. What does that mean? It means that you can connect to it with a web browser. You don't need a, a screen on it. It means interactive means you, 
make a task happen and it gets carried out right away. You see the results. You can see what's going on in the system. You are logged into the system. It's called Cockpit, like we said. And although the project is called Cockpit, our goal has been to build an interface for Linux itself. So when you log in on a CentOS system, you see CentOS. You don't see Cockpit. You see the features of CentOS. You don't see Cockpit's idea of what the system should do. So keep an eye, keep, keep an eye out for that as we go through the demos. You won't see Cockpit anywhere in the actual user interface. In fact, you'll see it in the about demo line. That's about it. So let's take that second use case, a complex feature. Let's make it easy, make it a complex feature, easily accessible. And in this case, we're going to try to make a network bond. Now, we've all made network bonds. And the first step to making a network bond is to read a blog post to figure out, for my system, how should I do it? Is it network manager? Is it network scripts? What's expected? What's supposed to happen? Is it going to come back when the system reboots? Lots of questions, lots of opinions. What if you just wanted to get about your business? Your intent here is not to create a network bond, but to solve an actual problem. I'm going to go into networking. And you can see here I have two NICs. I click Add Bond. I'm going to check, choose the, the ones I want to include. There we go. Make this one the primary one. There's all these modes, but I'm going to leave it on active backup. And boom, we have a network bond. I don't like the IP address. I'm going to change it. Now, let's try again. There we go. Okie doke. There we go. We have a network bond. No blog posts were read. So do you see the idea here? It appeals to people who are just coming into Linux, lower the learning curve, make it accessible, get them involved, but also for those of us who just couldn't care less about that specific feature, how it's implemented, we just want to get it done and move on to what we actually care about. Here we go. So, by the way, you're going to see these things flashing. Those are the videos in case things go totally crap out on my computer here. Then I'll show you the video, um, just in case you're wondering. Here's another example, troubleshooting SE Linux. When something goes bump in the night with SE Linux, it's often hard to find out what the problem actually is and why. So, let's take a look at an example here. For this example, I'm going to connect to a Fedora system. Here it is, you see? This one said Fedora server. The other one said CentOS. <coughs> and let's go into tools. We can see SE Linux troubleshooting is a nice menu here. And look at all these nice little failures, huh? Look at this one in particular. We have 19 occurrences of this one. It's expanded. It says that, well, SSH is having problems. SSHD can't access these keys. Strange. Let's look at the details. Oh, and here's how we can fix the problem. Let's click it. And we're done. Um, we could actually, to be honest. Let's, ah, I missed part of the demo. I was supposed to show you how this actually fix the problem with SSH and not just the GUI, but we can do that later. We can, we can make that happen. I have a terminal up here so we can do fun stuff on the system it's, it's, itself. Actually, let's do that now. Let's do this right. Okay. So, I'm going to... I'm going to go into system. It's prompting me for a password. It can't access my SSH key. I don't like that. So. I, had, I reset this server with that script that you saw. We can see that the issue happened again. I'm going to apply the solution again. And now I should be able to go into the system. And I guess not. Well, anyway, there's the first bummer. <laughs> you got a twofer, actually. Um, but this does actually work. It fixes the problems. And you're, you can interactively diagnose what's going on and learn from this as well so that you can figure out what the commands are on the command line. You'll see this throughout Cockpit. Things are named the way that you use them on the command line. We don't want to keep you hostage in Cockpit. 
you can use it together with other tools. And I'll show you more about that later. But let's move on. So, what about mounting an iSCSI disk? We're starting to get a little crazy here, right? Uh -oh. Mounting an iSCSI disk, lots of options, lots of settings. Uh, let's do that. I believe I'm going to go back to my CentOS machine. I'm going to go to storage. And I am not trying to do this. Let's try Fedora. <laughs> Sorry about that. Here we are. Ah, ice guys and targets. Let's log into. Cheat. So this is real stuff. I'm not kidding around here. And then, I'll show you the video on this one. Sorry, <laughs> I screwed up on this one. Okay. Here we go. So. Yeah, that's Fedora. So like we said there, we're going to go down. There's no SKB target set up. That's the initiator name. That's what we're going to connect as. And we're going to connect to. I'm going to figure out <coughs> what exactly like I typed it. But it's just not, it's just not working right now. There we go. We add this target. We see that these. There we go. There's a, there's a disk available for us. We can go in and see information about it and format it as we do. All right. So, and here we go. Another example. Let's drive, Let's start a container. Let's move on over to containers. Start Docker. How's it running? There we go. Here's the images I have available. Uh, let's start a Fedora container. And we're going to put it inside of it. There we go. And here we have Clever Ptolemy up here. Nice. I can go into the container. <coughs> PS is not available inside of a container like that, I guess. Fedora container by default. They've slimmed it down a lot recently, I guess. Let's yeah. try. We, we did take a lot of things out. Yeah, that's good. I noticed I was pulling it here, and it was only 67 megabytes, which was pretty impressive. I was like, what? It's done? There must be an error. Um, so let's, let's, let's make some CPU usage happen in this nice little container. And again. Okay, let's try it over here. Here we have. Yeah, you see there is some. We can change resource limits. And here I'm also having a problem. So memory and the, the CPU recording isn't working. Hmm. Let's try another container. We'll try this again. Let's give it a shot. Let's start off with that. With some memory limits. Sometimes Docker doesn't set up the right C groups when you uh, start a container without any memory limits in the beginning. So let's see if that's the case here. Here we have another one. We can go. Ah, we're getting some data. Let's try. And 
we're not seeing it. But ah, trust me, I have seen this. <laughs> Show you the CPU usage. Oh, look at that. It didn't actually work. Hmm. I've seen this have a problem with a Docker update in the past. But never mind. Um, I can then I can change this image. Make some changes inside of it. I can then stop it, commit it. Would make a tag if we want, and start. So I'm interactively working with this stuff. You can see here's my image, which I can then run in various other ways with the stuff that I've installed. So, so how does this work? And trust me, if this worked anything like Webmin, I'd be out of here. Because <laughs> running out. This is totally not. Anything like that, I hope you get that idea out of your head. The whole reason I got excited and interested in this project is not just because of what it does, but how it does. So we're going to talk about that. So, Cockpit is pure interface. There's no mid-tier. There's nothing listening on the server. There's no Node.js, PHP, Perl backend. There's no, there's no big Python uh, WSGI application. There's no REST interface. It is pure front end in the browser, and there is a transport that lets it talk to all the various system APIs that are present on a modern Linux system. In fact, when you go back in time, like to CentOS 6, it's not really back in time because it still works, but those system APIs don't exist, so it's really hard to run Cockpit there. Cockpit is a result of Linux being more integrated than ever before. Different projects have taken ownership of parts of the system and say, I own this state. System D is no, there's no better example than that, but there's many of these. Docker is another example, um, Network Manager, um, Kubernetes, so on. <coughs> so, imagine you have all these different system APIs. Some of them are DMS APIs, some of them are REST. Docker, Docker does REST on a Unix socket, for example. There's files. Sometimes you place files in a certain place, and that is an API really, of the system. File processes, as you know, sometimes those are raw sockets. All of these are accessible are usable from cockpit in the UI. Now, how does this actually work? It turns out, on the system, we have something that runs sort of like a shell. It runs with user privileges in a real Linux session, and it's called the cockpit bridge. And it, on its standard in and standard out, sends data like this, JSON messages. Some of them, sometimes it's streams of data, sometimes it's uh, uh, binary blobs, and so on. But it's just on standard in and standard out. Um, here, for example, we have a dbus call to set static host name. Here we have a dbus call to run a ping command. Here we have some replies to those, a string that comes out from the ping command, and so on. But, web browser can't talk standard in and standard out to a process that's running somewhere on the system. So how do we make that work? There's something called Cockpit WS, the web service, or the web socket. WS stands for all sorts of things, whatever you want it to stand for today. It listens on port 9090, and the web browser connects to it with the web socket, and does that standard in, standard out there, and this maps it to a real Linux session running the Cockpit Bridge. So, I'm going to show you in real, real life how that works. Let's pop back to our Cockpit session. Okay, here we are. I'm going to open the JavaScript console so I can start typing JavaScript. And I'm going to access, I'm going to spot a command. Or maybe, maybe I'll access a DMS API this time around. So proxy equals, I'm going to, well, I, I could just, I'm going to, instead of typing all that for you, I'm going to create a little proxy object. This JavaScript does not know about this API. Where is this API? Let's, let's load it. Let's look at host ND. See if we have it. Okay, there we go. This is an API provided by System D for setting the host name, configuring information about the machine, and so on. And it's not loading right now. Maybe it'll load in a second. Okay, so we're going to create a proxy to that object in JavaScript, and from there, we can access all sorts of information about the machine. Here's its host name. Remember, we set it to my name. Here's its kernel release, and all sorts of stuff operating system, 
And um, we can even call methods on that. So let's call the set static hosting. Let's change it. Yeah, that's a good one. Let's change it to marmalade. And as we do, you can see, Cockpit reacted to it, actually. But that's not just Cockpit. Let's go to that system. Here it is, CentOS. And its host name is Marmalade. If I change this back, let's do this nicely so you can see what's going on. Um, you can see that the host name changes there, and of course, it changed here too. So this is, you're really logged in, you're starting to get the feeling that Cockpit is not pretend, not, not telling you about your system from afar, but it's there. It's logged into your system. Let's, let's do another example. Let's spawn a process from JavaScript in the web browser. Let's clear that up. Uh, oh, that, the command's already there. Nice. I'm going to run ping with that argument. You can see the output is coming. We're running ping for real. And if I go back to my browser, I mean to my, sorry, my terminal, and ping, you see that command is actually running in the Linux session. Of course, do things like stop it, terminate it, and it's gone. And it's not gone yet. Huh. Nice. Well. Yeah, close it with a string. Close it with a string, yes. <coughs> That's not working. Okay, we're getting a lot of demo fails today. But that's so the, the thing is, all of this stuff in the, in the, that you see in the fancy GUI is implemented in terms of things like this. Talking to the Linux system for real, the same way you would. But let's do something cool. Let's add a plugin to Cockpit. And what's really cool is, is doing this during a lightning talk. Because it's possible to add a piece of functioning UI to Cockpit as fast as writing a shell script. And you can do this within a lightning talk. <coughs> We're going to export a directory over NFS. I've heard um, there's some, is there an open pull request? I think there might be already in Cockpit, or at least a proof of concept of uh, being able to configure NFS shares and what machines can access and authentication via Cockpit, but it's not in Cockpit yet. So because it's not in Cockpit yet, Let's fake it. Let's build a plugin. Let's put something in Cockpit that does this. A simple version. Okay, here we go. Let's take a look at what we have. So here I am, my Dojo directory. I'm going to change it to this demo directory. Here's some files here. The plugin consists of these two files manifest.json and NFS export. Let's take a look at the first one. It's very simple. Build JSON tells us that. We should show from the tools menu, the label should be NFS export, and the path is the path of the other file. And let's copy these files into, hey, I have a command, into the CentOS system. Now, the place to copy these is documented. I'm not going to bore you with the documentation. I'm going to copy it in. Those two files went up. Now, let's take a look. Now, in order to see something new in the menu, there. What is this? There's no NFS option here. No cheating. No log out. So that it picks up. Oh. So that it picks up new stuff. And let's look at the tools menu. And here we are. Okay, so we have a little simple plugin. And yeah, this is kind of like a cooking show where you bring one. I kind of half made. But but don't worry. Just a second. We're gonna export a directory over NFS. And I click it, and nothing happens, right? Let's take a look at what happened on the system. This is the CentOS system. Let's click over to the CentOS system. And we can see that it actually is exported. I'm not joking. Let's uh, do it again. Let's do something else. And so it's actually kind of working, but it's broken. So it's halfway finished. Let's, let's, let's edit it and take a look needs to be fixed in there. This is really just an HTML file. Let's see. We include some CSS to make it look pretty, some basic JavaScript. In this case, we're using jQuery. We don't have to. A lot of Cockpit doesn't. This is different kinds of uh, UI components. And here we see the path label that 
place where we type the input, where we type it. Here's the button that we bonk, export, and when we bonk it, we, uh, we see that when that's clicked, we call this function called run. And that pulls the path out of the input field, and it spawns this command, export fs with that path. And then it has this argument here. Well, it turns out that command needs to be run as root, needs to be run as sudo. So by putting this here, Cockpit does that for you. If you notice on the login screen, there was an option. Let's take a look at this again. See this option here? It says, reuse my password for privileged passes. You can uncheck that, and then it won't be able to escalate privileges. But if you check it, it'll be able to use your password to do sudo, should it need to. So let's go back. Here we are. Now, you can see that there's a to-do here, and it's missing a lot of stuff. Let's finish this. So, what do we want to do? We want to we want to watch that file for changes, and we want to call a change function. Let's here. Let's define that change function. Let's let's clear the output. Once this changes, and we're going to go and spawn another process when the file changes. We're going to say spawn. <coughs> and we're going to export fs, all the stuff, all the goodies, and then again, we're going to do that. And when this process is done, it's all display. So here, let's have to define that nice display function. And We'll put the text that it gets out into data. All right. Let's see if we got that right. We we'll copy those files back to the system and refresh. Hey, it's showing us something! Yay! And now let's explore something else. And yay! It actually worked. But check it out. We didn't actually connect that to the export button. I want to show you something really cool. This underscores how Cockpit works and how it's implemented. You've seen already a couple times Cockpit react to the system. And that must be a complicated thing to do. But it's not. Let's go to that CentOS system and export. I think we can do something like this. And let's export. Oh. We made our already a piece of UI that lets us do something useful on the system, reacts to the system, and we did it in five minutes. That's how easy it is to build stuff in time. Yeah. <laughs> All right. But there must be a big tax to pay to get all that awesomeness. It must be punishing, huh? Let's, let's, let's take a look. Cockpit is zero footprint. If the server is not there to run cockpit, cockpit starts on demand and exits when not in use. The server is there to do other things. You log into your server to troubleshoot it, just like, just like you, you don't have an SSH session always running on your server. You don't have these things consuming resources. The server does its job there, and when you need to access it, you do. And that's the case with cockpit. You might think I'm making this up, so let's take a look. Now, because we've been accessing Cockpit a lot, it's running. Let's log out from our CentOS system. And I'm, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to restart it. So that, actually, let's stop it. So what we're going to do is watch. We're going to watch for any process that has the that has Cockpit in its name. So this is on the CentOS system. We're watching for any process called Cockpit. When I refresh, when I access it, if I'm refreshing the page, <coughs> Cockpit OBS starts. That's socket activation as implemented by system D. Now, when we log in, we see a whole bunch more processes <coughs> start up. There's session process, the bridge, there's privilege process, there's PCP for gathering stats. Actually, let's change this command around a little bit. You'll start to see because start to see that 
That didn't work the way I expected. Okay, I guess it's scrolling off the screen so the grip and that stuff doesn't work. But now when we log out, you can see that that all went away. And then after about 10 minutes, RPW itself goes away. And there's literally nothing running in your system. Buffett is a real login session. It doesn't invent, invent its own authentication. You see this theme over and over throughout Cockpit. It doesn't store data. The system stores it. <coughs> it just shows it. And that's nowhere more true than with the authentication, with access privileges, with privilege escalation. Oops. I seem to have jumped to the wrong place. Nice. Okay, here we are. This is the slide. My cue for another demo. So let's log in as admin. Oh, caps lock. And let's pop over to a terminal. Hey, here's a terminal on my pink pony, the name we <laughs> gave to our SunCloud system. And if we type ID, we can see that it's actually running as admin. That's who I logged in as. Um, this command is running as admin. And I can see this session here in login control. See, I'm logged in as root, admin twice. Um, let's <coughs> show our carpet session. There it is. Again, the process you saw before, all running as admin in a real, honest session. Carpet runs in a uh, login session, a system D session, a login control session, a SE Linux session, a PAM session, just like you would expect from that. And look, there's, there's even the less command run anyway. Um, let's take a look at this. Let's log out. Now, in this particular system, I'm allowed to log in as root. So I do. And now, hey, look, check it out. There's a little hash prompt. And root. <coughs> Again, we have our session that you might. And, of course, the session is running as root. So, real session, no magic. Cockpit works over SSH, and it would be a real magic trick, um, and I would, I would expect a standing ovation if you could connect from your browser to SSH port, but unfortunately that doesn't work, so you guys have to stay seated. Um, but, but we can use Cockpit over SSH, and this is, um, it's a bit pragmatic. Let's take a look at how it works. We looked previously at this picture of, there's the APIs, there's the bridge, there's Cockpit WS, we had a stream going back and forth to them, allowing the browser to communicate with them. A Kafka can also connect to another machine from Kafka WS through that same WebSocket and connect to its standard I/O port. So just over SSH, Kafka Bridge is listening on input, standard input, standard output, and we connect to it over SSH. Now we connect to the, the system APIs on these other machines directly. So this kind of could be a bastion host up here. These are the machines that don't have port 99 in this thing. We don't have anything running that's open on the network there. In fact, some people use Cockpit in a way that this is their local machine. Local host. And it just connects out. The local host is just a way to make the browser less stupid and be able to connect to SSH, right? <coughs> Let's look at how that works. So here we go. I'm on a CentOS machine. Here's my dashboard, which lets me add different systems. And here we have a one, the CentOS system. <coughs> Let's connect into a Fedora system. That's its host name. You can see it's actually connecting in over SSH. So there's the fingerprint. We haven't previously connected to this, so it says, please check the fingerprint. And in this case, I'm going to know that this is the right fingerprint. And there we have listed Fedora example. Let's click on it. You can see that there's suddenly two machines here. And there's different things here. Wait, when I go back, this machine has different capabilities than this one. On CentOS, I can configure Kato. On Fedora, I can't, for some reason. Um, and the, 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 the cockpit, again, like we said before, it's about administering the machine, not making the machine cockpit's machine. Right? The, the capabilities are specific to the machine on the Linux that's installed. Let's add another machine here. Let's, go. Let's add a Relatomic, an atomic host machine. 
That's the host name. There's the key to get the fingerprint. And this time, if, you, if you've ever used Atomic Host or many cloud instances, you can't log in with a pass username and password. So, actually, uh -huh, demo bug. I'm logged in as root. My demo's not going to work like that. You should never log in as root. Okay, back to these machines. Let's try this again. There we go. But here it says I can log in using the available credentials that are here. What's available? There's this key available. And it turns out this SSH key, which is on my CentOS machine and under this administrator user login, is not enough to connect to this atomic host system or to already have worked. Let's look at which keys we have. Loaded. These are real SSH keys. Let's, let's, and this is not. Uh, fake. Let's go into, I'm on the same CentOS machine. I'm going to go in as admin. Now I'm logged in as the same user here and here. And if we go into SSH, we'll see that there's a bunch of SSH keys. These are the same ones you're seeing in the UI. Um, my pink, my pink phone is <laughs> But one of them has is not available for use. Let's turn it on. Oh, it needs a password to unlock it. Let's unlock it. In fact, here, if we go to password, we get a little hint that says, if your password, if your SSH key password matches that of your user, Unit's user login, the one you typed in the login screen, or the one you would type on VT or SSH, then we'll automatically load those SSH keys. And let's go back over here. Ah, now it's available for use, and we can connect. I, I just want to point out, like, we're not kidding around here, look. Uh, that was that's not uh, that's not uh, password authentication. It needed my SSH key, and if I if I remove all of them, you can see it's trying to use SSH. And if I cancel that, it's failing. This is really implemented. No 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 bullshit demo here. This is really actually working. Now we can connect here. Oh, there we go. Let's go into that machine. It's an atomic host, and it has other options. Oh, look, it has software updates. This is OS tree. We're going to look at this in a second. But you can see it's very different, again, from the other ones. All right, so we connected to machines over SSH. We used SSH keys to do that, just as you would from a Linux SSH session or terminal. Now, let's, show, let's take a look at how Cockpit interacts with other things going and doing stuff on your system. We saw that before with, with NFS a little bit, where we did stuff from the terminal and it showed up in the UI. Let's take this a little step further. So here we are on our Relatomic host system. And there is an update. There's an update that we could boot into. So Atomic Host works like this. You have the current operating system version that's running. And if a new one appears, you update and boot into it. It's an atomic update process where you're either running the old one or the new one, and you're never running a half-updated system. Um, there's, of course, CentOS versions, uh, uh, builds of atomic hosts as well. Um, in my case here, the, uh, on the VM, I didn't have time to change it over to that, but this is all possible with CentOS as well. So I could just bump this button here, and it update and reboot, but I'm not going to do that. I'm going to take it one step further. In this demo directory, which had our NFS plugin, we actually have uh, an upgrade file. Uh, sorry, an Ansible playbook file. And it asks the system to upgrade itself and be really simple. And let's run that against our system there. Let's move this down so we can see what's happening. Let's see. It wants to use my SSH key. There we go. And you can see the, the UI is actually reflecting that something's going on. The button has been disabled. And now this playbook is running. Let's give it a minute. <coughs> hey, right, look, it switched to the atomic host. Now it's restarting into the new system. It's 
restarting to the new operating system version. And there we go. We can reconnect. And now we can see that's running this one up here. Of course, in this UI, you can see what packages are involved in this, in this operating system version. You can see here uh, that there's an older version of this. We can, of course, click back and roll back to this one if the first one was causing us problems. You can do that through the UI, obviously, as well. But you can kind of see how you can interact with the system through configuration management tools, through Ansible, through Puppet, um, through terminals, through your own custom scripts, and have the UI not get in the way of what we have. Yeah. And now we're running this one again. You kind of can get an idea of what an update entails. So, there we go. Um, one of the cool things about uh, uh, Cockpit is that it uses Patternfly, which is the toolkit. So if that looked familiar to you, there is a toolkit available called Patternfly, which is used by all sorts of projects now. And it makes things seem less foreign to people when they switch between projects. They treat them as a Linux system admin project in their head. And suddenly it feels like it's all part of one big story rather than every last tool saying its own thing. And the, thing, the, the beautiful thing about that is we get to have kind of an organic mix of all these tools building off of each other. They look consistent to people and that really allows them to come and approach um, the stuff that we build at Linux. So, we have usable Linux system, they're discoverable, and there's no excuses. There's no big dependencies, there's no, there's no, you don't even have to have the port open, it's zero footprint when not running, and, and the, the list goes on. I could talk about this forever. And we're gonna have some more cool bonus demos and stuff if you would like, but I'd also love to hear questions or ideas of what we want to play with on the screen, because we can just, Go wild from here. Yeah? Well, let me have a figure out. I was trying to write a um, plugin. Is there a way to run a command as a specific other user? Assuming that assuming the user logging in with has privileges. I don't think in the in the in this JavaScript uh, uh, API that we have that cockpit dot file API that we have, um, there is, it, it, that's not a first order concept, so you might run sudo, su, what, uh, okay. user. Got it, okay. yeah. Um, and I don't, and there is an update to, for sudo coming that should allow it to <coughs> make better use of that privilege prompting thing, the, the privilege escalation option on the, on the login dashboard. Um, so there are a few gotchas right there right now, but Soon that will work a lot better than it does. Definitely if you log in as root, it will work. And definitely if you log, if you're on an atomic host instance, that will work. Um, but yeah, pop on IRC. And IRC, we're on free node um, and hash cockpit. Uh, and then we can help solve those kind of problems. And if you find a bug as well, we can fix it. And one of the cool things about cockpit is we do a release every week that's stable because we have continuous integration that builds all of this together and makes sure that it works before anything gets merged. And so bug fixes come really quickly, your contributions show up very quickly, um, and that's a really fun part of interacting with this project. Yeah, um, where's the password store? Is it on the client side, the yeah. server process? Could you say where's what store? The password. So where's the password store? That's a good question. It's very sharp. So when we log in, the password, if we choose that option, let's, let's show it again. If we choose this option, the password is indeed cached. It's cached in the cockpit WS process. That's the last place that had it. And we, were, we thought, well, the best place to cache it is not copy around any further. Just keep it there uh, for use when needed. If you don't check this option, then the password is immediately thrown away. There's no reuse or caching of it whatsoever. So it's cached in memory if you choose that option in the cockpit WS process. Yeah? Is it possible to completely hide one of the available modules defined, for example, uh, say Linux or networking? 
So the question is if it's possible to hide one of the modules, uh, like SA Linux or networking. And the answer is yes, it is possible. Uh, and uh, well, let's log into the documentation. So there's a deployment guide and a developer guide. And this describes how the, those packages are laid out and where they're placed. Uh, so let's, let's do this on the system right now. It, we, it describes that we look up in this order where the packages are found and packages with the same name override each other. So if I would like to over, let's, let's, let's make this actually happen. It's possible. Let's hide this virtual machines thing because this system doesn't run virtual machines. So I'm going to log into that system. Uh, on this system, you can of course deploy this little script or your tool of choice. I'm going to go in here, and this was so. Here's the machines directory, which has just like the RNFS export one. It was this is all the stuff. There's a manifest.json and a bunch of files, some CSS, some JavaScript, some HTML that made that page show up. Now, we don't want that page to show up, so of course we could delete those, but that's kind of hacky, right? Because they might be owned by RPM or something like that. Instead, let's make a, the, same, the same directory. <coughs> the same directory in the cockpit. Uh, <coughs> In this directory here. There we go. And let's make a manifest JSON file so that cockpit makes this as a package. Let's not put anything inside it. And now, again, this is very risky for me. I've never done this before, but this should work. There we go. It's gone. And in fact, it says 404.found because I had that in the URL. And it's gone from the menu. Obviously, the rest of cockpit still works. And if I try to access that part, it's not there. So there's a good example of how to compose packages. How to, if I put those packages in the home directory of the user, you saw me previously even be able to refresh the browser and just have new packages. If you do stuff in the system directories, then you have to log out and log back in to see changes, like we did here. Uh, but it's very easy to get started with this stuff. And there is tutorials here, developer tutorials on how to Create plugins, use Dbus, even about the API, all of these different bits and parts. I, is there another question? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, you uh, added uh, other machines on the CentOS machine mm -hmm. in your demo. Where are those machines or the, the definition of those machines stored? Because That's you log out good. and you log back in and you still uh, access. Right. So this is something that we're actually tweaking right now. I'm going to show you where it is now. Uh, on this machine, we're going to bear live cockpit. This is on the CentOS machine. And you see there's a machines JSON file. And in there, there's a list of all the machines. However, this is not very uh, machine drivable. There's no tools to do this. And currently, we plan to make a drop-in directory in Etsy, where it should be put it in there. And in addition, you might have noticed there's a known host file here. Really, we should be using SCSSH known hosts instead. And so that's going to happen soon within the next few cockpit versions. And by cockpit versions, I mean next few weeks, because that's how often those versions are incremented. Yes? I see that you have a cluster of tab uh, that you never play with. Is that, for example, for parallel operation on multiple nodes, that's with one click? I, I thought you'd never ask. <laughs> <laughs> I'm that kind of guy, you know. <laughs> so I, this is this is this is fun. This is one of the extras that I brought. So I'm going to run OpenShift, which is a way to cluster uh, containers, to orchestrate containers. It's based on Kubernetes, and I'm bringing up OpenShift on my laptop. There we go. Now let's click on this cluster tab. I don't have. Oh, nice. Let's try it from a different one. And I don't have it there either. Oh, right. I didn't set it up like that. I'll look, I'll use it on my local system. So I'm connecting to localhost. This is my development 
machine you can see is all strange here. It's Fedora <laughs> and it's, that's what happens when you're testing. You really mess stuff up. Let's see if this works. This is on my local system on the laptop itself. The other stuff was in different VMs. Um, let's zoom in because otherwise we can't see anything. And I'm going to connect it to the cluster. Yay! We can see that. Uh, we can start to see the information about Kubernetes. We can see that there's no, there's one node running here. I can of course add Kubernetes nodes. Um, I won't do that right now. It's going to make my system go a little crazy. Actually, let's make my system go crazy. Let's see if this works. We're really going off road here, and this is the fun part. Let's see if that shows up. We can see that there's one container running inside of my cluster, not very much, kind of boring. Here you can see the topology of my cluster. Again, very simple. Uh, I'm going to actually start to scale this cluster for fun. Oh, I have it there. Let's make, I want, instead of one of that container, I want to make five of them. You can start to see, whoa, these containers are going to start coming up. You can see that the service, this is a service here, and it's routing request to this guy. Um, as, it as those come up, it starts to root request to the other ones. I mean, at least make it available. This is all fake. Uh, well, not fake. It's actually doing this, but it's on my laptop. No one's accessing this. There's no heavy load on it. Uh, but, but this really is running those containers. So let's look back at our containers tab. Of course, we have a whole bunch of containers here. And, you know, we can look at the logs of this. Apparently, we can't. So there is something a little buggy with accessing the window. I remember seeing this earlier in the other demo. There's nothing showing up. Oh, here's the information about the container, its environment, what ports it's listening on, and so on. We can, of course, Kubernetes has many different concepts, such as services. That those are the things that root requests to containers. You can see here. This, this is rooting to these <coughs> three different containers. Um, there's, uh, there's you, you can go really deep. There's deployment configs, which is a way of creating all of that, that topology and laying it out. Replication controllers, that's the thing I just changed. We can change it again here. We can push down to three, if you want. You can see that it starts to scale the number of pods that are, that, are, that are being replicated. Pods are a group of containers. So there's a lot of stuff here in this cluster stuff that's all sorts of fun for volumes and so on. Anyway, this is, this is a there's, there's so much in here, and, but I hope that, that you try it out and see if you like it. Um, and, uh, and there's also parts of this you can see as an atomic OpenShift registry that stores images inside of your cluster. You can see the various Docker images that are pushed, various tags that are pushed. You can see the stream of them, their hashes, there's information about them, their layers, all of that. There's a lot of fun in here. And you should try it out. See, if, see what works, what doesn't. Now, there's one thing I want to show you, but you're not going to ask about. So I just have to pull it out. I have to see which system it's on. Oh, it's on my local system. Ah, there's a lot of stuff here. But there's this one here that's really weird. So what happened here? <laughs> 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 um, I think, oh, Nautilus is running on his laptop. Well, it is running on my laptop. It's not running in my X session. It's running in my browser. Huh? <laughs> What's happening there? Um, oh, look, there's a JavaScript exception. This is not really, oh, nice, fun stuff. These are, these are actually canvases. See? And these are usable. These can make, currently at least, I tried it out today, these can make cockpit crash. Watch this trick. Yeah, it crashed. <laughs> <laughs> so, that's why this is not really in all the builds and stuff. It's in our examples directory as one of these toys. It shows you the kind of things that are possible. And maybe if there's an actual concrete use case for this, we finish this part up. It'd be fun. How about the React patterns? Oh, that's for, the, so the React patterns, uh, and design patterns, these are things that help cockpit developers know what bits of code to use, and how to make dialogues, how to lay them out in React. We also have that for jQuery, 
how to how to behave. Like we have a consistent dialogue behavior, so errors are shown here. This is how progress is, uh, of, a, of an operation is shown. Canceling that, and so on. There's also a part that is almost fully translatable. There's one or two more fixes to get in, but you know this tells people how to translate part. Any other questions? Any else, anything else you want me to poke? Yes? Anything uh, else than username and password authentication? So the question is, is there anything else besides user and password authentication? And the answer is yes. Um, we have, to log in from the browser, there's single sign-on in the GSS API, Kerberos, so the negotiate header. That works. Um, of course, that is all sorts of fun to set up. So I don't have it set up here, but we actually bring this up multiple times, I mean not multiple, hundreds of times a day during the integration tests. And you can see, not in here, but in the deployment guide, how to set that up. Here's Kerberos. Oh, single sign-on. Yeah, there's a lot of little funny commands, and even sometimes you have to modify your browser a little bit. That's just how it is um, with GSS API. So there's that. Then there's also, we saw SSH key authentication today. There's also SSH plus GSS API, right? MIC is used as the encryption and the authentication. Um, what else is there? Peter, do you know of anything else? That... Uh, well, we've done uh, like Kubernetes. Oh, right. Using that, like, just, like the version of Kafka that's just the Kubernetes <coughs> where the only login is using Kubernetes. So there are container versions of just this piece of the UI. So none of that local host stuff, but like just this or just the image registry, and then it'll work with the OS. You can deploy this into Kubernetes or OpenShift as a pod, and then it'll work with the OS stuff there to log in and use those OS credentials to then go and access all the stuff that it needs to. There's lots of things, and the authentication bits are pretty pluggable. I'm not going to say they're perfectly pluggable, but there's a lot of stuff going on there. Any other questions? If, if there aren't any, then is there any chance we could ask you to show us your developer workflow? Because that's again something which is just phenomenal, I think, from, from our side. Yeah, sure. Would you like to see something about CI and, and CD? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I. Uh, I had I gave a talk at DevConf, and uh, but I won't get that I won't I won't you know drag you through a whole talk. I'll just show you some. Actually, maybe the one from Summit from the Red Hat Summit. So you're going to see some Red Hat Summit slides. Um, so you saw. Let's skip through. There's nothing secret here. Or anything. So you saw how cockpit goes and touches the bits of the system. Um, this is the number of projects we've actually contributed to. So you can imagine when you're hacking on Cockpit, half the time you're fixing the system, and then maybe more than half, 75% of the time, and then 25% the of the time you're building UI. Why? Because it's so easy to build UI, but the system needs integration, needs to be built together. So that ends up being a big side effect of our team and a big goal of our team. We've contributed patches to all these projects, sometimes big, sometimes small, and the list of things that we actually directly poke and interact with an API is, is three times this long. Um, that would, you know, it would be crazy to put it on a slide. Um, yeah, I don't know if you've read the Count of Monte Cristo, but there's this is a graph of all the people who are involved, all the actors and all the, the like the protagonists plus the supporting cast and so on. Most books have like a single little line with oh someone comes in here and here's the mother and you know. It turns out later they get married and blah, blah, blah. But the Count of Monte Cristo is really unique. It's, it's just crazy how people who interact at the beginning come and interact at the end. And it's, it blows your mind how much interaction there is between all of the cast. And that's what Cockpit is like. And you saw this. I'm not going to do it again. We can interact with the API directly. So why doesn't it just totally self-destruct? When you have hundreds of projects, or maybe 150 projects, that each have their own releases, and some of them break API, and some of them don't care about breaking API, and how does this possibly work? How can it possibly work? 
And that's because cockpit lives and dies by its testing. It's an example of a project that could not exist the way it does without continuous integration and continuously testing it. We bring up 10,000 VM instances per day. This is actually used to be a little bit, slightly exaggerated, maybe bring up 8 or 9,000, but now it is a low number. I, on, a, on a normal day, uh, when everyone's hacking away, it'll be easily 15,000 instances, and the number of tests have increased since I made these slides. And all of these are brought up, they're quick <coughs> VMs, we boot real VMs, we boot CentOS, we boot 10 different operating systems, and test some feature and then whack it away. So each of these are very short-lived instances that come up with an app. And you need automation to do this. You can't have people doing the instances manually. Uh, so that's continuous integration. This is what happens when you open a pull request. Actually, this is a very old picture. Now there's many more things here. You, we test events around 10 different OSs, Debian, Ubuntu, RHEL, various atomic hosts, Fedoras, uh, CentOS, and then different browsers. Chrome, Firefox, Internet Explorer, and different architectures. You can imagine what's going on here. This is when, if you open a pull request to the README file, you would be firing off thousands of instances. Turns out it's cheaper for us, not because we have lots of resources, but it's cheaper for us in manpower to just fire off thousands of instances that go and test. You're totally not a change to cockpit, just to change the README file, um, <coughs> than miss someone else's change when they make a change to some feature and break something. So that the, the, we boot up those VMs and they're staged inside of Docker containers. It turns out you can run VMs inside of containers. Very weird stuff. You can run, we can run staging inside of a container. Then there's VMs inside of that. And sometimes those launch VMs, because remember there was that page with the virtual machines? So those actually launch other virtual machines inside of there. But sometimes those launch containers. I mean, it's just wild. Um, and so this is kind of how it works. And it's totally distributed. And this is it's pretty cool how we've gotten to this place over time iteratively. Um, there's these things called verify machines, and they run anywhere. They they run we sent a couple of them, or a couple of them in, in its Jenkins infrastructure, but we run these Fedora OpenStack runs a couple for us, so some of these are VMs. Um, sometimes these run under my desk just because things are going too slow and I'm impatient. Um, so they can run on my laptop. Um, the staging is pretty simple. And, and it's, it's scalable, it's, it's open source, it's reproducible. These, these verify machines check with GitHub's REST API, which is not open source, um, for what to do. They look for all, all the kinds of tasks that we can do. So let's actually do this. This is not like some kind of theory here. This is really cool. I'm going to just go around the park directory. Let's just do a scan. I'll talk about what's happening. Um, it's going to scan GitHub and ask, what should I do? Each of these machines do this separately. There's no single point of failure except for, in this case, GitHub. And it prioritizes them and slightly randomizes them for collision avoidance. It chooses one of the ones that it wants to, to, to do. And apparently, the Wi-Fi connection here is pretty slow, or at least the latency is pretty high. Yeah. Well, let's come back to that. Um, then they, with CI, the output of CI is really simple. It's a Boolean, a green or red, and a URL where the results are stored. And that goes out, we post in our case, some other host or Fedora people, anywhere we can push data over SSH. And we produce a URL in the public HTML directory of an arbitrary, you know, lots of places host random files. And all these machines, some of them can post to Fedora people, they might have credentials for that, some of them can't, but they post these things publicly. You can see them if we, that's still going on. So I, Probably any like live stuff here is not going to work very well. But we'll give it a shot. Actually, I should probably just use Firefox. Yeah. No, that's not working as well. 
Anyway, they post to a place, and those things that are <coughs> in those places post the status back to GitHub. Um, so we did a bunch of tests, we did a bunch of demos when we were giving this talk, um, but I'm not going to do this right now because the network connection is crappy. We have these images for all the various uh, operating systems and the machines pull them before they need to test on them. So there's a CentOS image, these are version, there's a Ubuntu image, a Debian image, a RHEL image. And we also track known issues. You can see these. Hi, oh, it's working. Let's see if this is working. Let's look at the pull request. There we go. You can see a lot of here's a green one, here's a green one, here's a red one. Red ones are more interesting. You can see these things have failed. These operating systems here. And let's look at the details. You can see that these are posted. In this case, it was posted to Fedora people. You can see the results. Here's a log. Uh, well, here's the directory that it's posted in. Uh, so we, we post this all over, and the key thing is to think about is that there's a URL that represents the results, and it's posted back to GitHub. And we track known issues. Which we, we, can, we, can, we can see which operating systems at any given time are broken in various ways. Let's look back. Let's look at the CentOS ones, just for fun. So we actually have all the Verifar machines post back to GitHub issues when something is broken. Let's pick a, here, network manager crashes on CentOS 7, or some update thereof. And we can go in there and actually see when it last happened, how often it happens, the core dumps of it, and all of that is pretty cool. Here's the crash dump, and you can see the bots kind of post back traces, and all sorts of bits and bobs when it, when it happens. And let's take a look. So that, that seems pretty impressive, but there is one. You know, it, it seems like, oh, how did we get there? How did we get to that point for that you know, effort? All the effort that's involved in making those tests work. And it was a lot of effort. But there's a, there's a little concept, a little thing that I want to show you about that. This is exactly how it happened in our project and how it can happen in your project. So, to summarize, continuous integration is assembling everything together like a real operating system. We reboot real instances. Uh, we don't fake that, or at least we fake it as little as possible. We'll do real things like IPA for testing GSS API. We'll do real things like subscription manager for checking whether RHEL can do a subscription. We don't mock up that, that kind of stuff out. So for us, we're booting IPA, uh, you know, directory service up a thousand times a day, or maybe like 500 times a day, and that's just part of doing business. And we do that integration for every single change, assemble it in production, test it like in production for every change. And then we can deliver an arbitrary one of those changes uh, once a week. Pick one, like, hey, that one, it's going out as a release. So we already looked at some of this stuff. Fun slide. <laughs> yes, we already looked at that. So, just one little concept, and then I'll shut up. Imagine, like, we don't have any trees outside, but imagine this tree here, and if, if we all came and carved this tree very carefully and painted all the leaves, and <clears throat> in the winter we went and took all the leaves down, and in the summer we went and put them back up, and we built the new branches on. It would take about 100 people, maybe more, to maintain a tree, to take care of the tree. Um, and this is what the, what the testing is like if you don't make it sustainable, if you don't uh, make it grow from itself. And in our project, somehow, the testing grows from itself. How does that work? Well, it works kind of like this tree, where you plant a seed, and the seed starts to grow, has an effect. And this is the seed of the <coughs> continuous integration work, and this is what we did in our project. We made the tests right next to the code, and they're changeable by the same people who make the changes to the code, <coughs> and, they, and then we post rapid feedback. You saw that, posting a rapid feedback through the GitHub status API 
back to the guys who make the change. There's so much cool stuff in the, in the CI now, but in the very beginning, we started with simple principles, and it was really done. There was all these single points of failure, there was no scaling, there was no known issues, there was no test streets and images, it was very slow. Um, but all of those things grow because everyone who's hacking on this stuff is really smart. And if you let them do this to your project, let them build a pull request that makes the testing better, and give, them, give everyone feedback on the testing so they see it, it's really alive and works for them, then these cool things start to grow. And then you end up with more than 10,000 instances per day, you end up with all sorts of, you end up with releasing every week, all these kinds of cool things um, are the after effect and as this grows and matures in your tree. All right, I'm going to say, any questions? Anything else you want to talk about? I think that from in many ways, the cockpit project actually represents the shape of how open source development is going to on ramp onto very very quickly. Where you know there is no RCM, you know version three is in sort of eighteen years after inception. I think what we ship in front of us today is version one hundred and twenty six, and and like you said a couple of times, right? There's this weekly releases that go through um, pretty much everything, all of the testing and everything, and. Uh, Thanks Seth, for coming along and joining us. Sure, it's my pleasure. Thank you. Try and talk with.